This is a special podcast series called How to Run Trophy Gold. My name is Jason Cordova. I'm the publisher of the Trophy RPG, as well as the author of the Incursion Hester's Mill and the Hearthfire Rules Module for Trophy Gold. Trophy Gold is not a difficult game to run, but it does have some unique and unusual mechanics and procedures. The purpose of this series is to explain the rules in a way that helps you better understand how to be a GM in Trophy Gold, as well as highlighting some of the design theory and play philosophies that help explain why the game is the way it is. This series assumes you have read the rules for Trophy Gold. You can get a quick start copy of those rules by going to our Kickstarter campaign page for the Trophy RPG, which is linked in the show notes. The show notes will also contain a link to a Gauntlet Forums post associated with this episode. If, after listening to this, you still have some questions, you can ask me on that forums post. This series is a production of The Gauntlet. You can follow The Gauntlet on Twitter at Gauntlet RPG or learn more about us on our website, gauntlet-rpg.com. If you appreciate this show and want to support it financially, you can do so by making a pledge on The Gauntlet Patreon, patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. In this episode, I'm going to talk about the combat role and the risk role. In the previous episodes of this series, I asked you to keep a few important concepts in mind. Sometimes you have to improvise, Trophy Gold is a game about collaborative storytelling, and sometimes gameplay happens in character, and sometimes it happens out of character. In this episode, I'm adding one more concept to the list, and that's this. A single die roll means a lot. Put another way, it means a lot of fiction takes place during a single roll of the dice. Consider this example. You have a thief-type character who needs to break into the study of the king in order to rifle through the king's desk and grab some documents and then escape the king's castle. Now, in Trophy Gold, that whole sequence, that whole scene, is probably one or two, maybe three risk rolls, right? But in a more traditional game, it would probably be a lot more dice rolls. There would probably be a die roll to pick the lock to break in through the window or whatever of the study. There would probably be a roll to move around quietly in the study. There would probably be a roll to rifle through the desk and find the documents. There might be multiple rolls to escape the castle. You might even do a combat if you have to face some guards, right? Another example is combat. So in Trophy Gold, everyone's actions in the combat, including the monsters, is handled in a single roll of the dark dice. Again, compared to a more traditional game, where first you might have to roll initiative. Everyone rolls initiative. Then player A rolls to attack. Player B rolls to attack. Monster 1 rolls to attack. Player C rolls to attack. Monster 2 rolls to attack. If the fight doesn't end after that first round, you roll initiative and do it all over again. A single combat could take 20 or 30 rolls, right? This idea of a single die roll encompassing a huge amount of fiction is very, very important to understanding trophy in general, and specifically the combat role and the risk role. Let's talk about the combat role. Now, I'm not going to discuss the hard mechanics of how the combat role works. It's actually pretty simple, and you can read the text for yourself. Rather, I'm going to focus on some procedural and role-playing aspects of the combat role. Now, please note that many of the things I'm going to talk about are not explicitly spelled out in the current version of the Trophy Gold rules. They are things that are either implied by the game's text or that come about as the result of good table technique. However, in the final version of the rules that will be in the hardcover book, these elements of gameplay will be spelled out more explicitly in the text. So the first thing is a procedural matter. When do you make the combat roll? Well, the answer is a combat roll happens when it makes the most sense in the fiction. It's usually initiated when the player characters encounter a monstrosity, and the only realistic option is to fight it in hand-to-hand combat. Now, as a GM, you have a special duty here when it comes to the combat role, because combat in Trophy Gold is extremely dangerous to the player characters, and you shouldn't force it on them lightly. The best time to force a combat is when a hunt roll goes poorly, or as a result of a complication or failure on a risk roll. The key is to use your judgment. If you adequately telegraph the presence of a monstrosity, and you gave the players a chance to avoid fighting it, go ahead and call for the combat roll if they don't avoid fighting it. And touching on something I said in the Set Goals and Hunt Rolls episode, if you just finished a combat, especially one where the player characters had to endure some pain, don't immediately drop another combat on them, or just be careful if you do. Find other ways of complicating their lives on a mid-result risk roll or on an encounter-something-terrible result on a hunt roll. Now let's talk about weak point. Once combat is initiated, the first key moment, and perhaps the most key moment, is establishing the weak point. When establishing weak points, don't forget to have the player say how their character is vulnerable in the fight before they roll the weak point. This is vitally important. 
Having the player state how the character is vulnerable serves a number of important functions in the roleplay, but primarily it frames up the combat scene. As players speak aloud how they are vulnerable, they tend to build off one another, and by the time they have each spoken, a vivid picture of the start of the combat has been painted in everyone's mind. This is extremely vital to making a trophy gold combat feel satisfying, so don't forget to do it. Now let's fast forward a bit in the process. After the players have rolled their dark dice for the combat, thereby revealing how well they did in the fight, what do you do then? Well, I'll tell you what you don't do. <laughs> um, as a GM, you don't say, well, players, you needed an eight and you got a nine. Congratulations, the monster is dead. Let's roll up some gold dice to see how much gold it's worth. Uh, no. By the same token, <laughs> you don't say, well, players, uh, you needed an eight, but you only got a seven. Uh, too bad. Uh, let's gather another dark die up and let's roll them again and see how you do. No. Instead, after we know what happens from the dark dice, you give every player a chance to narrate a little bit of the combat. Now, there's no hard and fast rule for how to do this, but I think that my way works pretty well. What I do is I ask each player in turn to describe their character's actions in the combat, and then each player, each successive player, will naturally build on what came before. And by the time they're done, you have this nice, vivid picture of how the combat scene looked on screen, right? Now, after they finish, I then describe the monster's actions, particularly if anyone took any hits. And note, players will usually describe the monster's actions themselves as they describe their own actions, um, and in which case, I just let their description stand. That's fine by me. There is one exception, though. When I intend to use a monster's defense, more on which later, I ask the players to focus on describing what their character does in the combat, and I let them know that I'll be handling narration for the monster. Another note is if the combat role was successful and no player takes the opportunity to narrate a killing blow to the monster, I will usually ask a player whose dark die contributed to the success of the role to describe how their character deals the killing blow. And let's consider quickly the case where the combat role is not successful and they have to go to another round of combat. Well, I handle it in the exact same manner, except I ask the players to emphasize how they aren't getting the upper hand on the monster in the fight when they describe things. Let's talk about monstrosity defenses. I mentioned in the Anatomy of an Incursion episode that I was going to talk more about defenses here. And so I want to start by saying what they are. A defense is just a special power or ability that the monster has. It's usually listed in their stat block. And the question is, how do they work in play? Well, the answer is it depends a bit on the type of defense. Some defenses are very mechanical in nature, meaning they have a direct mechanical effect that could be accounted for during the die roll. As an example, consider the werewolf from Hester's Mill. It has the defense Supernatural Endurance, and it reads, If not destroyed after the first combat roll, increase its endurance by one. That's really straightforward. Another example in the same incursion, the crow thing. One of its defenses, its only defense, is the crows have eyes. And it says, crow things can see what every other crow thing sees at all times. If you fail to destroy a crow thing after the second combat roll, another crow thing joins the fray. Again, a very straightforward mechanical application of the defense. Easy to do. But some defenses do not have hard mechanics built into them. Consider from Hester's Mill the example of the ghoul. The ghoul's special defense is sever limb. It reads, the ghoul's teeth can quickly cleave away any extremity that gets caught in its mouth. That doesn't have a hard mechanical application, right? It doesn't affect dice or anything like that. It's more of a narrative thing. Defenses like this are a permission slip to really bring the pain to the player characters. And so when the monster gets a hit on the character, you as the GM might consider adding some of these effects on top of the ruin score increase, right? So with the ghoul, in the instance where weak point is rolled and the character is going to have to bump up their ruin by one, you might also say in the narration, the ghoul manages to get his teeth around your wrist and he just scissors your hand right off right? And maybe that's a condition like severed hand or something like that, right? But it is a way of showing just how deadly and dangerous the monster is, right? And it's a permission slip to really, really go hard on the players. A little side note about rituals and combat. 
Now, I generally don't allow rituals to be used in combat because to me, the word ritual implies something that takes a little bit of time and is therefore not feasible in the heat of combat. Uh, That said, you might have a different opinion on that, or there are some rituals that do seem to indicate that can be used more quickly and would even be fun to see in a fight. In that case, what I do is I let them use the ritual in their narration of the combat. Um, There's no mechanical effect. I just let them use the effects of the ritual as they describe uh, how they're, you know, behaving in the fight, right? I do warn the player, though, that if they take a hit, that I will consider the possibility that the ritual backfires in some way, thereby making their lives more complicated. There's another question of what if the character is a little further away from the melee and they're doing the ritual while the other characters are doing the melee? This situation uh, can be a little tricky. You have to kind of think about it a little bit, but depending on the circumstances, it can go a couple of different ways. It might be a risk roll. So in the instance where the ritual would end the fight, like what the characters are doing is really just trying to provide cover for the person doing the ritual, that to me is a risk roll. I would have the person doing the ritual do the risk roll and the other characters would just be, their combat would just be flavor for the scene. There would not be a combat role in that instance. They might be vulnerable, like if the risk roll goes poorly, but I would not go to the combat role mechanics in that case. It might also be the case that the person doing the ritual is close enough for the monster to reach them and hit them, (laughs) right? In that case, I would actually consider that to be a combat role. And the narration that that character does is just them, you know, like on their hands and knees, scrawling out symbols and doing their ritual in the middle of the fight, right? It's your call as a GM, and you'll get better at making those calls as you get experience with the game. Um, So just kind of think about it for a minute. So before we leave combat, I want to just zoom out a little bit and talk about combat in a big picture way in Trophy Gold. Because on paper, the combat role and indeed the whole combat system of Trophy Gold, it doesn't seem like much. Especially if you're accustomed to games with complex combat systems, the number one piece of feedback or one of the biggest pieces of feedback we get is people read the combat rules and they're like, this is it? <laughs> right? Like this. Like it just doesn't look like much on paper. Here's the thing though. When you get the hang of it, the combat feels excellent because everyone is involved in setting the scene. The GM by describing the monster's initial disposition and the players by saying how they're vulnerable. Dark dice hit the table and everyone takes place in the process of riffing off one another and building an exciting fast combat scene. The whole process is guided by die rolls, but it's not dominated by die rolls. Die rolls are there to move things along, but it's not excessive. You're not rolling 10, 15, 20 times to resolve the combat. Combat and Trophy Gold, once you get the hang of it, is fast and dangerous and exciting, and it's unencumbered by lots and lots of die rolls. So now let's talk about the risk roll. I want to revisit the four concepts. Sometimes you have to improvise. Trophy Gold is a game of collaborative storytelling. Sometimes gameplay happens in character, and sometimes it happens out of character, and a single die roll means a lot. All four concepts are extremely important to the risk roll, and that is because the risk roll is the foundational mechanic of all of Trophy. It is the heart of gameplay for Trophy Gold, Trophy Dark, and the upcoming Trophy Colossus. Now, here again, I'm not going to focus too much on the hard mechanics of the risk roll. You can go read it yourself. I do want to talk to you as the GM and highlight a few things that you need to be aware of. And the main thing, the big thing, is that your job as the GM during the risk roll is to make sure that the procedure of the risk roll is followed. And the first step of that procedure is the player must first say what they hope to accomplish. They're doing something risky, and then they have to say what they hope to accomplish. The risk roll is a structured negotiation, meaning that as everyone at the table interacts with its various parts, they are also negotiating the outcome of the fiction. And when the player says what they hope to accomplish, they are setting a marker down in that negotiation. They are saying, this is what's going to happen if I get a six, right? And so it's an important part of the process. It really, really kind of like sets stakes, right? As the GM, you have the right to dial the player back a bit if what they're asking for is implausible, but you should try to be generous here and try to accommodate the player as best you can. Because here's the thing, even if they ask for a whole scene's worth of actions for their one role, there are lots of ways it can go sideways for the player character. 
there are very few clean successes in trophy gold, and so it's okay to let the players get a little greedy from time to time when saying what they hope to accomplish. The next part of the procedure is you, the GM, and the other players say how things could go wrong. This next step in that structured negotiation, this is an opportunity for everyone out of character to say how they think this could go poorly for the spotlight character. Now, none of this is set in stone. None of these suggestions are set in stone. As the GM, you are free to disregard the input of the players and just run with your own ideas. It's nevertheless a really important part of the process because by stating aloud what they think could go wrong, the players inject fictional possibilities into the conversation. And this can be helpful in a lot of different ways. First and foremost, a player might suggest something that you hadn't considered. You know, So even if you don't use all of their suggestion, maybe you work some of their suggestion into the outcome on the failure. Maybe they say something that isn't useful right now, but can be used in a future scene. In my own experience with this game, everyone at the table uses the ideas in future scenes. Like They use this talk of what could go wrong as inspiration for future scenes in the game. Like they, they call back to it or they think, oh, I, I really like what you said earlier. I think that'd be cool if it happened here, right? And this happens because to some degree, by players stating what they think could go wrong in the scene, they're kind of giving you hints, hints to everyone at the table about what kind of story they want to tell. It's a really subtle, but very, very powerful gameplay effect. And so make sure you follow this step. Now we start gathering dice. And the first light die, the spotlight player gets the first light die if they describe how they're exploiting their skills or equipment or the environment. Now, acquiring the first light die serves the same function as saying how you're vulnerable in a combat role. It sets the scene. When the player states aloud how they're going to accomplish what they want to accomplish, they instantly shape the shared fiction. Consider my example of trying to sneak into the king's study, right, in order to steal some documents. If the player exploits their acrobatic skill, suddenly the nature of the scene is perhaps very different than what people thought it was going to be like. Now we imagine the player is going to, you know, deftly hop from place to place so that no one can hear him or see him. He is going to grab the documents and maybe do somersaults and ledge grabs, you know, out, out the window, right, to get down to the ground. Maybe they're going to, like, run across a narrow footpath or a narrow top of a wall to escape guards. It's a very action-packed sort of scene all of a sudden, right? But consider if they say... I'm going to exploit the environment in this way. I think that because this is the king's study, there must be lots of thick, luxurious rugs. And I'm going to make sure that I only walk on those rugs in order to muffle my footsteps. That's a really different scene, right? It's suddenly more of a scene about being quiet, about being stealthy. And indeed, it shapes the fiction in an even more subtle way because by saying, by reminding everyone that the king is rich, that there are these you know luxurious, thick rugs, everyone starts to fill in details in their head about what other kinds of like richness might be around. Maybe you, know, you start to imagine tapestries and chandeliers and all kinds of things like that, right? It builds the shared fiction. What if they say they're going to exploit their equipment? What if they say, I have black clothing and I have some soot and I'm going to you know, put the soot on my face so that I am just completely blacked out and I'm going to stick to the shadows? Again, it's a different kind of scene, right? Suddenly, it's a scene about moving between the shadows. It's, a, you know, it's just a different kind of thing. So when the players do this, they really, really say a lot about how the scene is going to go. And they can also do a combination of these things, right? They can exploit skills and equipment and environment all at once. Bear in mind, they only get one line die, but still, it has the same effect. It just really establishes what the scene's going to be like. Now let's talk about the second light die. This is the light die that they get for accepting a devil's bargain. And a devil's bargain, to remind you, is something that happens in the fiction no matter what. Like, if the player accepts the devil's bargain, this thing is going to happen no matter how their die roll goes, okay? And it's usually something that sort of makes their lives complicated, right? Now, the devil's bargain is so important. When I say the risk roll is the heart of trophy gameplay, what I really mean is that the devil's bargain specifically is the heart of trophy gameplay. The devil's bargain is how your group tells a truly unique story, because fulfilling the devil's bargains can cause the fiction to go in all kinds of wild directions, things that the incursion did not anticipate. Like, and, and that's great. Like, that's highly desirable. That's what trophy is. Now, the devil's bargain is a literal negotiation, right? 
And there are a few things that you should keep in mind as the GM. At first, the playgroup is not going to be very good at it. Until the players get the hang of the Devil's Bargains and start to have an understanding of how it affects the gameplay, it will be on you as the GM to make good offers to the Spotlight player. But trust me, they will eventually catch on. It might take a few rolls or even a whole session, but they will get there. And when they do get there, when they do master the Devil's Bargain, oh, chef's kiss, like your sessions are going to be so, so good. Another thing to keep in mind is understand what is a permissible Devil's Bargain. And quite simply, it's just that you have to be able to satisfy the Devil's Bargains no matter how the die roll turns out. Put another way, the Devil's Bargain can't negate a success or a failure. Consider the example of a player character trying to leap across a chasm in order to escape a pursuer. If the player offers the devil's bargain of no matter what, you'll not quite make it and be hanging from a root sticking out of the side of the cliff. That is not a permissible devil's bargain because it negates both success and a failure, right? Because a success is leaping across the chasm. Well, if they don't quite make it, that's negating the success. If they fail and the failure condition is they're going to fall to the bottom of the chasm, well, <laughs> you, the devil's bargain is not set. You can't satisfy it, right? Because it just doesn't work. Now consider the offer of no matter what, you'll lose your grip on your weapon and drop it down the chasm. That is a permissible devil's bargain. Because if they drop their weapon, but they still make the leap, then that's fine. Like, the, dropping the weapon had no effect on them making the leap. If they fail, <laughs> they're, they're going to be dropping a lot more than their weapon, possibly, right? So it's a permissible devil's bargain. It's maybe not a super exciting devil's bargain. Consider this. No matter what, your jilted lover, who you've been avoiding for months, will just so happen to be on the other side of the chasm. This is an amazing devil's bargain. This devil's bargain is, it's, it's quite separate from the action of leaping across the chasm, and that's good, because devil's bargains that are somewhat fictionally removed from the direct action of the risk roll tend to be a little better and a little more workable. This is especially good because it introduces a wild new element of the fiction, right? Like, suddenly the story is getting interesting in ways that no one anticipated. This is a great Devil's Bargain. The dropping the sword one is a perfectly satisfactory Devil's Bargain, but, uh, and sometimes you're going to have those just kind of simple ones. But once your players really get into the swing of this, they're going to offer you the Jilted Lover Devil's Bargains, and uh, that's great. The next part of the procedure is adding a dark die. Well, if they're doing a ritual, they have no choice, so that's the easy one. And... 90% of the time in Trophy Gold, the players usually opt to wait for the dark die. They know they can add it in later after they see the first result of their light dies, and that's perfectly fine. I want to note here, it's not directly relevant to our conversation, but I want to note a, a real difference between Trophy Dark and Trophy Gold here. In Trophy Gold, because the players are trying to keep their characters alive, they really try to avoid taking the dark dice on the risk roll. <laughs> like, it's, a, it's something they don't want to do. In Trophy Dark, because the characters are going to be finished at the end of the session and because it's a sort of play-to-lose style of game, players are a lot more likely to want to take the dark dice. They want to see the bad stuff happen, right? So just an interesting um, dichotomy and really the thing that separates fundamentally Trophy Dark and Trophy Gold, right? Now, moving ahead a little bit, the dice are rolled, okay? And we know what the result is few things to keep in mind here. One, be mindful of who has the right to narrate the scene. You, the GM, narrate failures and complications. The player narrates successes. Don't take away the player's privilege of narrating their success. You can dial them back if they get a little crazy in their narration, but, um, but in general, the player has control of this. Another thing here to note is on a four or a five, you have to have a complication uh, you have to offer a complication to the, or not offer, you just say what the complication is. A couple things about complications. This is not in the rules of the game. Um, it's not explicitly stated, but it's somewhat implied. I usually say what the complication is so that if they have the option of adding a dark die and trying again, they have a little more information to make that decision with. I just think it feels a little better in play. You don't have to do that, but that's how I do it. Another thing about complications, coming up with complications is more of an art than a science, and it's something you get better at as you GM more games. Because of that, I can't really teach you how to do complications, right? Uh, but I will say this, a complication cannot negate a success, okay? That's kind of similar to the devil's bargain. Like, whatever the complication is, 
the success has to fundamentally still be a success, right? So in the case where they're leaping across the chasm, I can't have the complication be, oh, you don't quite make it, and now you're hanging from a branch sticking out of the cliff. That, to me, takes away the success, because success is getting across the chasm. On the other hand, I could say, you leap across the chasm, but you land really hard on your ankle, and now your ankle's busted. That's a perfectly fine complication because they still fundamentally succeeded. They were trying to leap across the chasm to avoid a pursuer, and they did that. Yes, their ankles busted, but <laughs> but they did succeed. So just notice that difference. It's a little subtle, but kind of think about it. That's how you kind of get good at complications too. Like really thinking about the complication in context of in the context of success and failure helps you get better at creating complications. So I want to wrap up this episode by talking about the combat role versus the risk role and kind of when to use them. In most cases, it's going to be super obvious when one or the other is called for, but sometimes it won't be immediately obvious whether a situation calls for a combat role or a risk role. And there are some pretty common examples that come up, and I'm going to go through some of those and kind of tell you how to handle them. The first one is attacking with a ranged weapon, so like a crossbow or a bow and arrow. This really depends a lot, kind of like the rituals, it kind of depends a lot on the setup of the scene and kind of what's going on. So if there's no melee and you have the enemy in sight and you're going to shoot a crossbow at them, that's a risk roll. It's a risk roll because there's no melee, right? If the enemy can't feasibly fight back, it's a risk roll. If, however, the group is involved in combat and you just happen to be a few paces away using your bow and arrow, that's a combat roll, right? Another situation that comes up is fighting a monster in order to escape. That is almost certainly a risk roll. If you're fighting the monster to kill it, no question that's a combat roll. But if you're fighting a monster just to sort of give yourself some breathing room to get out of there, that's a risk roll. Use your judgment as a GM, but in my opinion, that's how that should go. That should be a risk roll, because if you can't kill the monster, if you're not trying to kill the monster, and you're just trying to get away, I I just think it's more of a risk roll. And in that case, you probably have the player who suggested that everybody escape instead of fighting. You have them roll it, and have their roll stand for the whole group. Unless the circumstances would require multiple risk rolls, just use use your judgment. Fighting a large group of monsters you can't possibly kill. Say... You're fighting like a group of 20 goblins or something, or you're surrounded by a whole pack of werewolves or something, right? That's likely not a roll at all. That's probably just instant death. (laughs) You can tell the players that, like, if you stand your ground here and try to fight your way through this horde of goblins, you're dead. Tell them that, um, and then see how they want to respond. In that case, they're probably going to try to escape, and that's a risk roll. What about fighting a swarm of tiny creatures, like a swarm of angry hornets or something? That's a risk roll, and really, the better way to think about encounters like that is those are traps, right? Even though they're creatures, those are really more like traps, I think. Uh, In any case, it's a risk roll. So that concludes the How to Run Trophy Gold series for now. These first three episodes cover 90% of the things you're going to run into when GMing Trophy Gold. We'll be doing some more episodes in this series later in the year talking about advanced and side topics. If you have any questions about any of these episodes in the series, find their relevant forums post, uh, which are linked in the show notes, and ask us there. Thanks.